much. And uh, we will be trying to record this session again. So uh, I'll remind my panelists that uh, when you come up here or when you're up here, if you could use either this microphone or this lapel mic, that would be great. And, uh, and, and so hopefully we could get a good recording of the session. We started these sessions uh, last semester and we'll continue them for a while. And we'll pick up people as we go along, as we are today. Uh, we've done three sessions, one on intellectual property, one on industry-funded research, and a third one on entrepreneurship. And they're all kind of linked together nicely. And uh, they're linked together because of a number of things that you're going to hear today. So we'll tell you a bit about what we're going to tell you, we'll tell you, and then we'll tell you what we told you. Uh, they're linked together because when we look at the, uh, the general economy, although it's improving, I think everyone recognizes that we need more lift, we need more innovation, and we need more job creation and company creation. And that's recognized from the highest echelons of government all the way through university uh, leadership around the country on through to most faculties of engineering and the sciences. But we wanted to catch more people than just the engineering and the sciences where they're kind of in tune with this and offer these sessions to anyone and everyone who wanted to learn more, whether they're coming in from the Department of English, classics, uh, nursing, or what have you, because there are opportunities for everyone today in these uh, new ventures, if you will, that we're looking forward to. So today we're going to cover intellectual property, and intellectual property is kind of the grounding, the foundation uh, of what we're talking about in general, which is creating innovation. Intellectual property is that property which allows you to obviously go to market with something that you've invented, something that you've innovated, and hopefully take it to a, a good end in the, um, in the economy so that you could start a company or license your technology to a, another company and benefit from it, but at the same time, benefit the economy from the research and the kind of work and scholarship that you do. The way these three are linked then is that intellectual property is the value proposition that ties together our work with industry and our opportunity to create new ventures. And I think that's important to understand why it's important to start here. In the past, in working with industry, we often had companies come to us that would want to license technology that we had already invented or improved technology, maybe with a little more research, and then license it. Today, what you're going to hear about is more and more companies come to us and say, why don't you start a small venture around that technology, uh, take it a three or four years closer to market, quote unquote, de-risk it for us, and then if we like it, we'll buy the whole company. And of course, that's really kind of exciting and prospect when, when we think about that and look at how well that can uh, go for us. In fact, we have some notable examples here at MU where things have gone very, very well along those lines. I think Steve Wyatt may refer to Radel uh, at some point. I think we also look at Newsy as another example of that. In fact, if we go way back in time, uh, ABC Laboratories, which some of you may know about on, on Route 63 and off Route 70, really had its start here at MU in the chemistry department with analytical chemistry expertise. Those are all good examples of our expertise going out to the marketplace, creating value and putting people back to work, which is ultimately what we're looking for. So these three sessions in that way are kind of linked. We are turning a corner in terms of our culture at MU. We are valuing this kind of work. And it comes at a good time because it comes at a time when, of course, it's harder and harder uh, to maintain research groups as federal funding continues to dwindle. And it dwindles mostly as a result of uh, lack of resolve, uh, but also because of just that uh, small amount of inflation that occurs every year and the fact that we just don't see budgets increasing. So competition for NIH funds, competition for NSF funds and the like has all gone through the roof. And while we compete and compete well, we want to supplement those funds as much as we possibly can uh, with funds from other sources. So it makes sense for us to go out and to actually really try to work and partner with companies in our state, in our region, and frankly anywhere in the world that want to come here and work with MU and with you uh, on areas of your expertise. 
It's also important to know that as part of that pivot, we're taking a more, uh, I think, nuanced approach to intellectual property now. Uh, in the past, over the last 30 years, like most universities, uh, if a company came here and wanted to work with you, we'd say, okay, that's fine. Go ahead and fund it. And uh, if um, Rebecca or whomever invents something, we own the invention, and uh, we will tell you how much we think it's worth, and uh, we'll tell you whether or not we're going to let you uh, license it based on price, cost, and other considerations. That turns out to be a really good way to, uh, to chase away industrial dollars and uh, corporate research dollars. And we've turned the corner on that. And we realize that that's probably not the smartest approach. The smartest approach is to be more nuanced and to let the faculty member really lead us through that decision-making process. And for all intent and purposes, to be the decision-maker on that uh, so that we know whether or not it makes sense to fight for the intellectual property that may result but may not result, or whether it makes sense to not worry so much about that and take those real dollars that are in-hand dollars today, get the research done, educate some students, and, and live to fight another day, if you will, over intellectual property. Okay, so why are we covering IP today? As I said, it's the grounding, it's the foundation of everything else that we do in this area, so it's critical. Uh, we hope today to give you a good sense of what intellectual property is, all right, uh, why it's crucial to you, if you don't already know, and then more importantly, perhaps for some of you, how to actually create it, document it, and the like here at MU. So uh, when you leave here today, I hope that you have a pretty good understanding and a thorough grounding uh, in each of those areas. But more than that, you have an idea of who you could go to uh, or tell your colleagues who to go to uh, if, in fact, they have questions and they aren't sure what to do. And that's really what this is most about, is getting the word out that we're here to help, uh, that we're here to assist, and that we are enthusiastic about uh, promulgating this among the faculty and getting more faculty involved in thinking along these lines, which is new and newer for most large public research universities, but not as new, interestingly, at, pub at private research universities where they've been doing this for years. So we have an illustrious panel here today of people who I really mean are folks with enormous expertise and background, and they'll get up and they will introduce themselves. And I think those of you who have the, uh, who have the, the outline in front of you, you can see the agenda will include Bill Turpin. Bill, do you want to raise your hand for a minute? Uh, Bill is an MU graduate, as he'll tell you, and has tremendous experience in industry and also uh, as an entrepreneur himself, quite successful. He'll talk about the industry perspective. James Levin and Dennis Crouch, both from our law school, where we have instituted a new center of intellectual property law uh, for entrepreneurs and innovators, uh, which I'm really excited about. And our office put some of the founding uh, dollars into that, and I'm very happy about that. Dennis will go on and talk a bit about the business perspective. Steve Wyatt, who is here, who is the Associate Vice Chancellor. Steve, you want to shake your hand a little bit? Uh, raise your hand. Uh, Steve is a true expert in, in business and also law. He has a JD and an MBA, and he's been on this um, a topic now for a number of years, at least a couple of decades, and is both enthusiastic, knowledgeable, and highly energetic. Uh, Luis Jimenez. Luis is back there. Luis is one of our proud MBA graduates uh, who is now running a company that has come out of MU successfully, and we are really excited about the work that's going on there. Uh, then we'll go to Scott Ullman, who will talk about university policies. Uh, Craig David, Craig's here. Craig is leading OSPA, and he'll talk about identifying IP. And then we'll move on to uh, uh, Lana Nedlick, and is Paul here? Yeah, and Paul Hippemeyer, uh, both of whom are going to talk about tech transfer. And then we'll have our summary and closing. Uh, this month, I'm actually uh, interim president for the system, and so I'm going to have to leave a little early today, unfortunately. So Steve Wyatt will, in fact, be giving the closing. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to uh, the next person, which will be Bill Turpin, I believe, right? Or Steve Wyatt, would you like to say a few words next? Bill Turpin? Okay. So I'd like to turn it over to Bill. And uh, Bill, do you have slides here? Yeah. 
That's it. Perfect. Thanks, Hank. You bet. Uh, I'm going to try to real briefly cover uh, who am I, why am I here, and why should you care. Uh, three simple topics. Uh, so first, uh, is the audio coming through? Good. Uh, I was hired to take uh, entrepreneurism and innovation here to the next level, and that's pretty broadly defined. So let me talk about it for a minute. If this will work. How did you do this, Hank? How did I do it? Uh, I didn't use that, actually. I used the keypad on the... Okay. Yeah. Okay. So as Hank said, I, I, uh, I'm from Missouri. I grew up in a small town called Bowling Green. Uh, my dad was actually circuit judge there for a while, and later we moved to St. Charles and went to high school. Uh, everybody in my family went to Mizzou. We didn't even think about going anywhere else, so I came here and got an electrical engineering degree. My dad wanted me to be a lawyer, and he thought... Uh, engineering degree would be fine, pre-law degree, but I just stuck with the engineering thing. Uh, as soon as I graduated, 78, I moved to Houston, Texas, and worked at Texas Instruments. I stayed in Texas for 10 years. Uh, I met my wife there in Houston, and while I was at, uh, in Austin, I went to UT and got an executive MBA degree. Promptly quit my job at TI and started a company. The company was acquired uh, by a company in California. I moved there in 1990, right after the big earthquake, so I missed that. Uh, I did multiple startups while I was there. Uh, my biggest claim to fame is I was at Netscape, basically the company that invented the Internet. Uh, Eighteen months after Netscape started, we did an IPO, and the company was, at that point was worth $3 billion the day the stock market closed that day. So zero to three billion in 18 months. That was one of the big IPOs in history. Uh, after that, I started a company and raised over $10 million from some of the big Silicon Valley uh, venture firms, Kleiner Perkins. They're the smartest guys in the world, I think. They did Amazon, Google, Nest, uh, a lot of great companies, including mine. That company crashed and burned. Uh, I had to lay off 50 people and close it down one day. And then later, I was actually at a venture firm for a while myself at Red Point Ventures. I was an uh, entrepreneur in residence. We looked at uh, several things that we didn't pay for, but Google did, like Keyhole became Google Maps. Uh, Android became this thing that Google does. And then I moved back just this last summer to Missouri, uh, and I currently am CEO of the Missouri Innovation Center. We run the Life Science Business Incubator down by the research reactor. You've probably driven by it probably wonder what goes on in there. I'm going to describe that for a minute. Real brief, I'm not going to go through my whole career, but I have an analogy uh, of using surfing and waves to describe businesses. Basically, a startup company needs to find an opportunity that's small today and would be big tomorrow. The reason it has to be small today is startup companies don't have a lot of money. So like if you wanted to start a new airline or a new hotel chain or something like that, you need a lot of money because those are established businesses. So you need to find something that's small today and will be big later. Fortunately, I was in the computer industry at pretty much the right time and the right place. Uh, when I got out of college, uh, personal computers came out just a few years later. Uh, that's a picture of the very first computer, IBM PC. I bought the first one in Austin and started working on it myself, sort of in my own time. Uh, I think I paid $3,500 for it, which is a lot for a computer that only has 64 kilobytes of memory and no hard drive. Uh, so it was a significant investment, but that's all I had to invest to start a computer company. From then on, it was just my time and effort that went into it. And as I said, I started a, a, a I did a Windows product. That's what was purchased, uh, moved me to California. Then I was involved in the internet, uh, which is, I think, the world's biggest wave to surf. Um, later, I got into user-generated content before that was cool. Before blogging was called blogging, I had a company that did blogging. Uh, then I got into video games, 3D virtual worlds, uh, mobile apps, cloud services, and then whatever's next. Now, it may look like a lot of different things there, but they were all kind of steps, one step after another. And uh, a lot of times people in one company were involved in the next company. So 
it's, it actually leads to uh, a better progression than it looks like. I think the characteristics for people that are surfers like this is you have to be a lifetime learner. You have to keep figuring out what is a small thing today that's going to be big tomorrow. You have to have a willingness to try things. You have to have a willingness to quit a good paying job, try something. And you have to have the ability to adapt because almost no business goes the way you planned it will. Uh, you start off doing one thing and you pivot and you end up trying a couple other things before you're successful. Try this one. Okay. So why am I here? So Silicon Valley was the big wave for silicon, semiconductors, uh, internet services, networking. But I think Missouri could be a place for big wave surfing in a lot of other areas. I read a book before I came here called Caught in the Middle. It basically says the whole life science thing is ours to lose. All we need to do is have the capital and the will willingness to take risks to become the center of some new technology areas. And I, so I've just listed a few here. Some are things we're already doing. Some are things we've already got in the incubator. Um, and the other is another area of some software companies that I'm broadening our charter to start doing in the incubator as well. These are all areas that are small, relatively small today. But we have the technology and the research going on here to actually catch these waves as they become big. So that's, I think, the opportunity. And hopefully, everybody in the room sees something there on the, on the list that maybe they're working on. Or there's others. There's probably a lot of other things here at Mizzou that I don't even know about or other people don't know about that could be the beginning of something big that's going to happen. So Hank talked about this a minute ago. I mean, Dr. Foley, sorry. Uh, uh, one of the things I come in with, I'm not a PhD. Uh, I'm sorry, interim president. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry, Dr. Foley. Um, he talked about, I'm from industry, not from academia. And so when I look at this, I sort of see that the university and all we've got going with all the great intellectual property we're developing here, but we're not by ourselves. We have to coordinate with funding agencies, NSF, NIH, et cetera, and we have to coordinate with the commercial world. Traditionally, what we've looked at here is we receive the funding from the uh, agencies, uh, and corporate world pays us dollar in, uh, in order to get intellectual property. That worked years ago uh, when industry was doing a lot of their own R&D internally. They spent billions of dollars on it. The problem is the corporate world today has gotten leaner and meaner, and they don't do hardly any internal R&D anymore. Uh, they've cut their departments. Uh, just last week, there was a huge layoff in Boston of one of the big medical device companies getting rid of their PhDs, basically. Uh, what they prefer to do instead is acquire startups um, and so it's led to these things where um, it's a little harder for us to get research funding. Uh, industry is less interested in funding things because they're not doing things themselves. And uh, because of that, it's inc increasingly difficult to get licensing revenue out of the companies. Part of the solution to this is what do what companies want, which is create innovative startups. So that adds this piece at the bottom here where you create companies, they're the ones that license the IP from the university. They de-risk it by adding additional development to it. They raise additional capital. They put energy into it. They can oftentimes de-risk it also by finding the market that's suitable for the technology. And Luis can explain how they did that with his company. Um, and they start going through the regulatory approvals for those products that need it. That's when, if you get phase two approval on a medical device, somebody's going to buy it. So that's the preferred vehicle now for large corporations to acquire a lot of the IP. And a lot of universities are figuring out that this is what they need to do. Sort of California, MIT, and others are adopting this model. And I would submit we are in the beginning process, middle process, of starting to adopt that model, thanks to Dr. Foley's great leadership. Uh, well, uh, so why, 
Why am I here? Another reason is I run the life science business incubator over uh, by the research. And essentially, if you think of an incubator, you put like a baby in an incubator and it helps the baby grow and thrive. We do that for companies. So we take a founder of a company, entrepreneur, and we surround the entrepreneur with the things that an entrepreneur needs so they don't have to worry about everything and they can sur survive and thrive. Primarily, that involves getting, helping them get capital. Uh, so a lot of the companies at the incubator have raised significant amount of capital. Luis is working on his third million dollars now, I think, uh, or fourth, somewhere in there. Um, we provide lab space, office space, uh, access to legal help to evaluate patents or form your company, et cetera. We provide mentoring, coaching, and uh, all those kind of services. So if you've got an idea and you're not sure about it, you just create an appointment with me, you come in, we'll do an assessment, and we'll help figure out if your business might fit this model and might be a good client for us down at the incubator. The typical engagement kind of looks like this. And this kind of leads to the rest of the uh, speakers today who, who manage these various steps along the process. So um, as a university researcher, you file the disclosure with the university. And as you come up with inventions, uh, the Office of Technology Management, represented by Paul over there, helps uh, look at those and decides which ones to file a patent for. Uh, the university then files some of those patents. Uh, that's when we get into the shaded area. Step three there, uh, sometimes the people involved in the project will say, hey, this is a great project. I believe this is commercializable. I want to start a company. Sometimes it's they themselves that want to be the business person. Sometimes it's a person like Luis that they find who becomes their collaborator. And the, Luis handles the business side while Dr. Sheila Grant continues to do research. There's various ways to do that. But eventually, a company gets formed. They move into the incubator. We help them with their business plan, which involves the market analysis, et cetera. Along the way, once they are pretty convinced there's a really a business here, they go in with their case and present it to the Office of Technology Management. And they say, we would like to license this, and we will help the university take this IP and make something of it. And the university actually evaluates that. They won't let it just anybody license uh, our technology. But you go through that process, and the little company ends up then having the rights, typically exclusive rights, to take that technology forward. So then the company with that ownership right can now raise money because they have something of value. They have this intellectual property. And uh, we'll define what that is and, and all why it exists today. Uh, they then raised, raise money do additional development, start their clinical trials, whatever is appropriate for their company. Uh, they start demonstrating progress. Um, they get FDA approvals. They, they sell it in the market, et cetera. And hopefully, they become a successful company. They move out of the incubator into other space and become a successful company. Um, so that's kind of the process for creating those innovative startups. Uh, you can get in at any step, but typically it starts with you guys. It starts with people doing research in innovative areas that have a protectable scientific principle. And we have a support system that involves all these people here that kind of help you take that and go through this process and come out at the bottom, hopefully, with a very successful company. So that's my presentation in a nutshell. I'm, I have to leave to go to a meeting. So, Hank, can I take a couple questions now or, sure. or not? Do we have time? Yeah. Any questions? How early in the process do we get I would say most of you are already in step one or two, right? You're already doing research. I know you are. Yeah. And um, you're filing your disclosures. I was just asking how yeah. early in the process we enter the trajectory with the incubator. Right. Yeah, so you're probably in step one or two. And the step three would be to come down and talk to me and have an assessment with me or Quentin Messbarger, who works with me. And we'll just kind of talk about, in general, what's your, what's your idea? How big might the bar market be? What's the steps to get it somewhere? Um, sort of an intermediary step would be helping you 
uh, do SBIR, STTR type funding. Uh, typically, those need to be with a company and not a university, but we can help you write those kind of research grants if you're still on the sort of translating the science into practical use. Um, once it's got practical use, then you definitely want to be trying to license the, tech, the, the intellectual property and forming the company and moving on. So there's, there's this process where, you know, the university research becomes IP that gets licensed, and that's, again, what this whole group of people is here to help. Um, we're, we're trying to make that system really smooth and easy. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, thanks for your time. Obviously, I'm not on the technical end of, of things. My name is Jim Levin. I'm at the law school. Um, I've been there for about 20 years. Earlier this year, Dennis and I became the co-directors of the new um, Center for Intellectual Property and Entrepreneurship that Dr. Foley mentioned. Um, I'm just going to speak for a minute or two about the center and then actually turn it over to Dennis to talk about both the legal and business aspect uh, aspects of, of um, entrepreneurship. Um, and I, again, I'm also going to have to leave early. Today's my heavy teaching day, and I have a class in less than an hour, so I'm going to talk and run, so I apologize for that. Um, but we, as Dr. Foley mentioned, he, he has helped us start a new center for entrepreneur, for intellectual property and entrepreneurship at the law school. Our mission is really threefold, and it's just getting under the, underway. We want to prepare our students for the changing legal marketplace. Um, we feel this is a good place for students to get into um, wonderful and, and interesting activities. We're working with local law firms or regional law firms like Polsonelli. Um, we also want to establish the law school as a leader in this area throughout the Midwest and the country. And we also want to support the campus, inter the campus interdisciplinary efforts in related fields, um, special em emphasis on IP, business, finance, um, and in the STEM areas. Um, and we want to do this through several ways. One, um, we want to, what, one of the things we're going to be doing starting next fall is to start a, a clinic at the law school, an entrepreneurial clinic where we, we bring in someone who will oversee students working on some of the issues that, um, that um, Bill Turpin mentioned, some of the legal aspects of it. We've hired a, a person named Jim Neiman. Um, he is an old graduate. He's 1991 graduate of the law school. He's been out in the world. Um, recently, he was the lead counsel for Assurant um, in their new product development area and um, worked with the new product development team on legally viable products, designs, patent applications, and other IP issues. He will be joining us in April, and he will be working with students beginning in the fall, um, serving, we hope, the, the campus the university community, but also the Columbia community in, in the Midwest. The center also wants to promote symposia. We're going to have a, a little mini conference on March 13th, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes that we invite you all to attend. It's really geared towards the university community, and, and I'll show you the syllabus. Um, this brochure will be... Um, sent to all of you, hopefully by email soon. It's just coming back from the printers tomorrow. I was hoping it would come back today. We want to do um, increase our curricular offerings for um, IP and entrepreneurship in the law school. We already have seven or eight faculty members on our, our, on our faculty who have enthusiastically signed up for the program. 
Um, we hope to negotiate with other schools in the university to create dual degrees. Um, and we want to basically collaborate with the university community um, to increase innovation and entrepreneurship throughout the University of Missouri. Um, we do have this conference on March 13th, so it's coming up fairly quickly. Um, oops. What? Yeah. There's one more page, which I have a few just Xerox copies I'll leave out here, but it's an all-day conference. It's going to start at, um, at 9.15. We have sessions, and we'll have academics, we'll have practitioners, we'll have several people on this panel here from the university community talking about various aspects. Um, we have a session on why trademarks matter. Um, we have an uh, a session with copyrights, the nuts and bolts of copyrights in a university setting. Um, we're going to have a keynote address by Dennis on the state of the patent system and its impact on new ventures. And that's going to be during lunch. Um, if you do want to come and stay for lunch, we are offering lunch. We do ask you to RSVP for that so we know how much. And when you get the brochure, there's a phone number there for you. After lunch, we're going to have a session on patents and innovation. Then finally, a session on intellectual property and entrepreneurship. So there will be academics. There will be attorneys. Um, we're having Catherine Early there. She's um, director and senior corporate counsel for LexisNexis, which is a big legal publishing company. And so anyway, we do hope you come. Um, you should get this soon. And, um, and that's all I'm going to say. I want to turn it over to Dennis for the more substantive aspects of, of this program. So are there any qu quick questions? Yes? Will you be sending that out through, uh, Gloria? through Gloria's office, yes. Uh, thank you, Gloria. <laughs> yeah, we will be sending it out through here. And we will have some hard copies of this, but they don't come back until tomorrow. Anything else? Any other questions? We're, we're really excited. We, we, we really hope um, that you show up and tell your colleagues, and, and this will be sort of our official opening of our center. And Jim Neiman will be there, too. I just found that out last night. He is the person we're hiring, so questions about the legal the clinic we're offering, this will be the first chance for him to, to answer your questions on, on that aspect. So thank you, and, and I do apologize for leaving but here's Dennis. You're in much better hands. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Great. Um, yeah, so my name is Dennis Crouch, and uh, Jim and I are, are co-directing this new center. Uh, and, and my background is, is uh, um, like Bill, I also have an engineering uh, degree, but I but then I eventually, after working in industry, right, so I have a mechanical and aerospace engineering degree, uh, but then I kind of graduated at, 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 from, from undergrad at, at the time of, of exploding internet and did some internet startup work. Uh, eventually, my wife and I joined the Peace Corps and kind of transformed uh, my career in that sense and, and went to law school. Uh, worked, uh, uh, worked at a big intellectual property law firm in Chicago for a number of years before joining uh, the faculty here uh, at the University of Missouri School of Law. Uh, and so at the law school, I teach classes on patent law, on licensing, intellectual property. Uh, I also teach uh, uh, some other classes like civil procedure, which is basically the nuts and bolts of going through the court system, uh, as well as, as real property. Uh, and so, so buying and selling of, uh, of real estate and, and the rights that go along with that. Um, now, uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Ho Dr. Foley uh, asked me to talk about f uh, really here is to take a step back and, and think about it from, uh, from really the core legal perspective. What are we talking about? What, what is intellectual property or what are intellectual property rights? And so that's what I'm going to start doing. Uh, and, so, right, and so this is kind of a mini, uh, almost a mini little law school class. Now, intellectual property... Uh, when, I, when I teach real property, we stretch back into the common law going back a thousand years and talking about real property rights. And, and surprisingly, there are some changes, but they are right, the rights are surprisingly similar in real property as they were a thousand years ago. Uh, the word intellectual property, at least in that long, uh, in that long historic timeline, is, uh, is relatively new. And in fact, kind of the use of the word intellectual property um, is really something we've just used in the past couple of generations. 
Um, and, um, uh, and, and we kind of have generally defined it as some kind of economically valuable right, um, which might be distinguished from just some personal right, but an economically valuable right um, to control some aspects of information. Uh, or, or perhaps to control some aspects of data, what other people can do with this information or what you can do with it. Um, obviously, we're in this growing knowledge economy um, where information really is, uh, generation of new uh, innovation and information really is a key aspect of the economy, and so this is becoming increasingly, uh, increasingly important. Um, a, a, a real issue that, that, uh, that goes throughout all aspects of intellectual property uh, is the recognition that information flows very easily and is hard to control. Um, whereas, right, if you have some physical property, right, I have things in my house that I own, it's easy for me to physically control that, but intellectual property flows around. Uh, and so that means on a global scale, um, strong intellectual property rights really only work well in countries where you have a strong rule of law. Uh, and so, right, and so we see this globally where in the U.S. we have strong intellectual property rights. We also do in Europe and Japan and South Korea. But extending beyond that, lot, most other countries, uh, although they have rights on the books, uh, it's difficult to, impossible to enforce such rights. Uh, and and as, we, right, as we continue to be in a globalized system where, uh, where the internet reaches to uh, potentially to every country around the world, um, that can create some real, uh, some real issues of, of protecting your rights, uh, whether or not you'll be able to reach out, whether, whether someone in, uh, in uh, uh, some country that, that has no protection may be able to take advantage of your rights. Um, so uh, I've, got, I've got here like a really simple, uh, a, a really, uh, uh, simple slide um, uh, that, that breaks down IP rights in, in a few categories. Now, uh, now the, the way that the government thinks about intellectual property rights uh, is, is interesting in my mind, and it goes back to the founding of our country. If you look at, uh, if you look at the United States Constitution, we have, there, we have in there an intellectual property clause. And even at that time, uh, what the founders of the country uh, uh, thought was that IP rights are a mechanism for encouraging innovation. And so the language of the Constitution says that Congress is authorized to create uh, what we call now the patent and copyright system uh, in order to promote the progress in science and the useful arts. And, and so that idea that we give rights to promote, right, to promote innovation uh, is you know, at least 225 years old, and it continues to be strong today. Um, and, and from a policy perspective, kind of the alternative, a major alternative, another way to promote uh, innovation is maybe to do things like giving grants or other, providing other funding. Um, but the genius with intellectual property, at least from a government perspective, is that it takes no tax revenue. Uh, and instead, uh, instead, we just offer rights uh, and, uh, and then just as uh, our prior speakers have said, it's those entrepreneurs that take the risk and, and try to figure it out. Um, but these rights do offer some big rewards. Um, now, uh, really, I, right, I said IP, the IP category is new. But, um, uh, and, and in fact, there is no such thing as, uh, right, you, you never go and enforce your intellectual property. Um, but instead, uh, instead, if you have intellectual property rights, um, it always fits within some pigeonhole of rights. And, and, and up here, I, I put a few, and just th I just wanted to talk through these just a little bit. Um, and the first here, and, and, the, and I think the main thrust of a lot of the university activity is, is in the patent context. Uh, and, and patents, right, to obtain a patent, you have to have a new and useful invention. Um, however, um, just because you have an invention doesn't mean you have a patent yet, but rather there's a patenting process where, where uh, you draft and file a patent application with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, uh, and, um, and, and that process takes about three years for them to examine the application and go through a set of negotiations with the applicant and eventually issue a patent. Uh, and, um, and, and once the patent's issued, at that point, the owner of the patent has exclusive rights to make and use, import and export that invention. Um, that process has problems, mainly that long timeline, 
Uh, and secondly, uh, it's expensive. Uh, the vast majority of, uh, of patent applicants hire patent attorneys uh, to draft and work through this process. Uh, and, so, right, and so we're typically talking about tens of thousands of dollars uh, to, to get through this successfully. Um, the, the usual rule, kind of the baseline rule, is that whoever is the inventor owns the patent rights. Um, however, uh, most organizations um, have as part of their employment agreement, uh, and University of Missouri is one of those, that, uh, that if, the, uh, if the inventor um, creates this invention as part, of their, uh, as part of their employment, let's say you're working in your lab uh, right here, here in, in the building next door, um, that you have already agreed beforehand that the university will own, that, own those rights. Uh, our university here offers, uh, offers kind of a generous uh, amount of what you might call a, a, a kickback or a reserve that if this eventually makes money, you also get further uh, resources, where in industry that's not typically the case, uh, and, right, and it's certainly an element to the extent that you're ever moving to a different university uh, and, are, are, and are part of an innovative, right, want to be an innovator, um, that, that right here at the University of Missouri, kind of in the marketplace, we're relatively generous as compared to other, uh, other universities. And that's, that's an element to take into account. Um, the one, uh, and, and with patents, I just always mention one major pitfall uh, that, that is common knowledge, um, but is important uh, in that, um, in, in that the, the best practice is to file a patent application on an invention prior to any public disclosure. Um, and if you, if you uh, let's say, right, which is contrary to a lot of thing, a lot of work of academics, where we are, right, part of our role is to publish. Um, and um, if you publish before filing your application, you will lose some rights. Um, now, it's, it's still possible in the United States to still obtain a patent if you relatively quickly file an application, but it, but it puts you at risk and loses rights for the rest of the world. Uh, and, so, right, and so that's, a, that's kind of just an important uh, kind of practice point. Uh, this uh, patent rights, uh, right, I mentioned, are in the U.S. Constitution and are exclusively federal law. Uh, and, and copyright, which I'll talk about next, is the same way. Copyrights are also exclusively federal law. And, and copyrights, instead of covering new inventions, uh, cover original works of authorship. Uh, and, and that's defined in the copyright statute uh, to include a wide assortment of things. That is, authorship is broadly defined to include kind of the written word uh, as well as audio or visual or audiovisual works, musical works, um, choreographic works, architectural works, sculptures, um, etc. Uh, generally, computer software is thought to be protectable under copyright um, as well as patent law. Uh, and so, right, and so there's, there's potential dual protection there. A, a major difference between copyright and patent law is the way that you get rights. Um, that is, with copyright law, as soon as you have an original work of authorship that you fix in a tangible form, as soon as you fix it, you own copyright. Uh, and so, uh, uh, early last week, I put together this PowerPoint slide and I stored it on my computer. That was enough to fix it, and therefore, um, I hold copyright to this, uh, to this slide. Now, normally, just the spoken word is not fixed in tangible form, but it's just these sound waves traveling. But because this talk is being recorded and stored on some digital device, then, uh, right, then there will also be copyright in, right, in this speech and the other, speeches, uh, other speeches here. I think, right, like patent law, uh, the author is presumed to be the owner. Um, but, um, uh, but uh, and the university has a little bit of a more complex um, arrangement with its faculty members on copyright law that we're, that we're not going to go into. So I don't really know uh, who owns this uh, or who, uh, right, uh, according to our agreement. Uh, and, um, right, Lan is the one who can answer that down there. Um, so um, a... Uh, a major caveat, uh, two big caveat, two, well, a major caveat with copyright law for entrepreneurs, as well as patent law, um, is that uh, right. Lots of times, new new ventures don't have the money to hire employees. 
you can't hire a full-time employee, but you, so you find some expert, maybe it's a grad student, to come and essentially work part-time and do some projects for you uh, in, right, in the scope of it, right? Uh, but, they're not, but they're not considered a legal employee, they're just what might be called an independent contractor. Uh, the, uh, uh, the usual rule for both patent law and copyright law is that, uh, is, is that unless there is a written agreement um, specifying that, there, that this worker does agree to transfer IP rights created to the company or to, the, to, the, to, to whoever has hired them, uh, then that independent contractor will continue to own the intellectual property rights that they create. Uh, and, so, right, and so that's a major pitfall that comes up repeatedly in startups where they don't properly do that paperwork up front and then, uh, and then later on you discover that although you paid for someone to create something, you don't actually own that. Uh, and, right, and, and so that's, that's a, common, a common pitfall. Uh, a, a second big element of copyright law is what we call the fair use doctrine and as academics we rely on this all the time. Um, that is there's certain uses you can, you can copyright generally has ex gives you exclusive rights to, to make copies, distribute copies, and make derivative works of some, uh, of some, uh, uh, of some work of authorship. Um, but the fair use doctrine says that there are certain limited uses um, that, that are not defined by the statute, but that, are, but that are kind of loosely defined. But certain uses just don't count as, as infringement. Uh, and so generally, uh, people think that if you're giving an academic presentation and you have some, right, and you take some copyrighted work maybe a paragraph from uh, a paragraph from someone else's book and you put it up on the screen to criticize it that's definitely fair use uh, and there's been lots of play in fair use and in fact the, the organization newsy was mentioned um, earlier and and for those of you who've seen right newsy is a gr is a really uh, exciting company um, and their business model relies upon fair use because what they do is take uh, take news reporting from other agencies uh, broadcast excerpts of that without license uh, and, then, and then make commentary on those excerpts. Uh, and, and, um, and at least they believe um, that's fair use. And the problem with fair use is that it's not well defined enough to know for sure um, whether, or not, uh, uh, whether or not it counts. Uh, just briefly, right, so uh, trademark law uh, is a third major area of intellectual property uh, and, uh, and lots of work going on there. And, and trademark really refers to the brand um, or, um, or, or something consumers use to identify your goods. And so, right, when you go to the store, do you see the bottle shape or the coloring or the lettering or the brand uh, or hear some sound that makes you think of some particular product or some company? All of those are trademarks. Um, trademarks are different from patent copyright in that uh, trademarks is really focused on the consumer. What is in the minds of the consumer and how does the consumer think about that and not so much about the, the actual innovation that's been created, right? We're, we're here at the other end uh, and um, trademark law uh, has also expanded with our market in that, uh, in that it used to be that companies in different geographic regions could have the same mark and, and they just had different customers and so they never worried about, uh, about butting heads. Um, these days uh, we've got a much more global marketplace for goods uh, and we have this internet that, that is a global communication where you would, where, where lots of comp where if there's multiple companies with the same name, each of them would like to have the .com website, right, or the Facebook account that's facebook.com slash company name. Uh, and so those, so, uh, so new conflicts have arisen uh, through trademark law. Uh, trademark rights, uh, you can register your right, um, but you don't have to register right. There's benefits of registration, and, and it's the same with copyright law. There are benefits of registration, but you don't have to. Uh, and, and trademark law is also interesting in that it's a dual state and federal law, uh, so, that, uh, so that there are Missouri state trademark laws and, and Illinois trademark laws and California trademark laws, and then there's also overarching national trademark laws. Uh, and, so, right, and so it ends up being a fairly uh, complicated area, um, but the nice thing about trademark laws is, is really uh, for somebody who's a rights holder, all of these are overlapping schemes that really make it easier to protect your rights. Uh, because you can choose one or a multiple of them, uh, and any way you go, you're usually, right, you're, you're very often okay. Uh, this last one on the screen is, is, is trade secret law, and trade, uh, so, so uh, one way to keep 
um, others from stealing your information is just to keep it within your head or keep it within your filing cabinet. Uh, and there's real problems with that, um, but, um, uh, but, there are, but most companies have a substantial amount of trade secrets. Uh, and so, so, uh, so, you, so you may have disclosed uh, your invention, but you might not have actually disclosed the exact process, the exact process that you go about. How high do you heat something, and then at what point do you lower the temperature, and how do you clean this room to ensure that there's no contamination, right? And there's just a whole series of elements that wouldn't be found in your patent application that are closed within your manufacturing process. All those are trade secrets. Further, you might have things like customer lists. You might have things like how much you pay um, how much you pay for your supplies, that your customer, your, your competitors would like to know how much you're paying, and they would also like to know how much you're selling your product for, for if you're not at retail, right, if you're selling to other businesses. All that's trade secret information. Uh, and, and our trade secret laws um, say that if you take reasonable steps to protect your trade secrets, so reasonable measures, then if, if somebody does steal them, you have a cause of action against them. Uh, and trade secret laws are generally state law, unless it's someone coming from a foreign country coming to steal your trade secret and take it back to their country, which is, right, which actually is a common occurrence. And in that case, uh, in that case, uh, you, there's a federal cause of action, both for civil case and as, as well as a criminal case. Now, the truth is, though, that most trade secret claims come about uh, when an employee is leaving a company. Uh, and, um, and, and, wants to, uh, and wants to maybe compete. Uh, and very often in the entrepreneur stage, what it is is you're at this point where you're getting bought out uh, and, uh, and you're moving on to the next stage. So it might actually be you, the founder of the company, who's leaving, um, but then gets sued for trade secret violation because you took the knowledge of the company with you. And so, right, and so it becomes a complex issue, and the best way to resolve that is at, right, early on you have some rights definitions in terms of a contract, and at the point of leaving, everybody spells out what's, right, what's going to happen. Uh, and, yes, ma'am? What is the legal difference between trade secrets yeah. among employees and students? Uh, yeah, well, um, so, so, um, so someone who is not an employee, so, so there's a general uh, sense that, so the question was, was between students and employees, what is the difference in terms of trade secret rights? Uh, and um, and, and if, you have, if you have an employee, um, the usual rule of employment law is that, is that if, there's, if there's something that you're keeping secret, that they have a duty to also keep it secret. And, and, and in many times, you'll also have them sign a contract where they promise confidentiality. And you can't do that with a student. And students are generally, uh, right, and, and a student is generally um, not gonna be bound by that. Uh, and so, um, right, as long, if they're not, an, if they're not also an employee. Uh, and so, right, and, and so I don't know if that issue has ever arisen here where maybe you have a, a grad student working in a lab uh, who, uh, who then goes and discloses something um, and that, um, that shouldn't have been, right, that kind of ruins your chance for publication or, div or, or ruins your chance to get a patent. Um, I, I don't know if that issue has ever arisen here and how it's been dealt with. Um, that's, that's our general counsel um, down there. Um, so um, does that, that, sure, thanks. so that's not a full answer, but, um, that's, um, but, right, so, um, so there are lots, there are actually lots of other intellectual property rights um, that we could talk about. Uh, so, uh, so there's rights of privacy uh, and it's mirror image rights of publicity. Um, there are a limited amount of kind of data protection rights. Um, and, and in the U.S., generally, data is not protectable. Uh, and so if you find some, right, if you find some data that somebody else has made available, you can copy it and use it for whatever you want. There's some limitations such as, uh, and, and in particular, when we're talking about new drugs and new drug treatments, um, the FDA has some limits on, uh, on the use of, if you're, if you're a follow-on generic or a follow-on biologic, um, there's some limits on how you can use the, uh, the uh, uh, original creator's data. And so there's some limits there, and there's a few other limits on data protection. Um, but then most companies also think about layering over this these contract rights. So, do, so, rights, so contracts of confidentiality, 
um, contracts, maybe non-compete uh, type contracts, uh, and, right, and if you're collaborating with another company, then we can create something that's usually called a joint research, research agreement uh, between some partner company, um, and, and all of those contract, right, those contract rights are nice when you can identify the other party and, and come to an agreement about how all this is going to be handled. Um, and, and all these rights are kind of in the background for when you don't have that contract. And, right, and, and, and really, when I, when I think about all this, uh, when I think about all this for the business environment, um, it's, really, right, it's really about layering these. Um, thinking about thinking about all of these rights, all, all of the, each of these rights have their own value and their own limitations. And, and if you're thinking about the intellectual property rights of the company as a whole, it's really how these stack up. Uh, and, um, and and then you kind of have to think about uh, what are the goals? What are the goals of my uh, of my company? Uh, and and I really liked um, uh, Bill Turpin's um, uh, talk about waves. Uh, and, um, and, and just the reality is for, uh, for any entrepreneur, um, there's, uh, there's a transition, right? There's always this transition from startup into a, an emerging company into right, something that, uh, that's right, where you've de-risked it and maybe you get bought out or maybe you decide to become, right, to market your product yourself and there's, there's these different avenues. But as you move through that, um, your company's needs, your company's resources change, and also the way your company uses intellectual property uh, change dramatically. Uh, kind of at this, right, at the get-go, um, at, at the get-go, um, patent rights and copyrights are typically, uh, and trade secrets are typically uh, kind of what companies have. And so it's that, it's that innovation, it's the stuff that's, being co that's coming out of the university that's the most, that's the most valuable. And, and, and why is it valuable? One is, right, one is that um, right, it, it gives a signal to other competitors that you've got this market. Uh, and, um, right, and, and, the, and, and what these rights really give you at the core is if somebody violates them, you, you can file a federal lawsuit, which you'd rather not do, um, but, that, right, but that's, that's kind of in the background. Um, then, um, um, uh, what it, but then what it also does is that as you're emerging, uh, and, uh, and, and you've done something, right, we're call, right, you've done this de-risking, where you say you had this idea, but then you take the idea out of the lab into the incubator, and you, and you are able to provide uh, enough proof that there's a market for it, and, there is, uh, and that you can actually um, deliver. Um, that you've got, a, you've got at least a, you've got a product that works, and, and there's this next step where what you might love is to have some established company buy this out uh, because they've already got the marketing channels and, uh, and they've already got factories that only need minimal amount of, of restructuring to be able to make your product. Uh, and so that, that kind of deal works great, but the question they're going to ask, the question they're going to ask is why should they pay you? Why should they pay you for this? Um, you've, prove, right, you've proven this is going to work. Why shouldn't we just do it ourselves, uh, right? And that's the background for our market economy, right? If you, right, if, uh, when you took Econ 101, you might have talked about Adam Smith and how, right, how our market economy works is that, uh, is that folks compete in the marketplace and whoever, right, and, and we've got, whoever can make uh, the quality product for the right price and deliver it for customers, they're going to win out, uh, right? And this manufacturing company has got, is going to be able to beat you out uh, in that, right, in that race. Uh, right, very likely, and so so the question is, what right? Why do they need to? Why do they need you? And generally, there's kind of two there's two answers. One of them is your intellectual property rights. Um, that if they just take it, um, then they're violating your rights, and uh, and you'll be able to sue them and 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 basically take away any profits they've made. Uh, and um, uh, and although right, you might not like a lawsuit, but it, in some ways it makes it all easy because then you don't even have to make anything. You've just sued them. Um, the second thing that is critical that's not in the IP sphere uh, so much, but it, it, in a way it is, is, is the knowledge and the value that the founders still continue to bring, right? And, and so, right, and, and, and lots of folks, uh, when they're thinking about this, think about a lot about the team that's in place. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, the, and the team as a whole is both, is both the people there 
in the IP rights and their knowledge base, uh, and, right, and all of that is, is often thought of as a package um, that can be, right, that can move over uh, into this, into this new, uh, new entity. Um, but if there's no IP rights, um, then it makes it, um, right, then it makes that buyout proposition really, um, uh, really tricky. Now, there's, there's in, in the business world, it, there are, um, uh, the IP rights are in many ways critically important, and for certain industries, you have to have them. Uh, and in this buyout sphere, um, it's con right, the, the IP rights are, are fundamental, um, but there are lots and lots of very successful businesses that really don't um, rely on IP rights. And if you, if you have some product and you want to start making it, um, you can do that. You can just start, right? You can, you, can, you can go to the market quickly. And in some areas, um, especially software app development, um, you can just go to the market quickly. Uh, of course, in that area, there's the background that it's automatically copyrighted. Um, but, um, uh, but you can just go and release it. Um, whereas in, uh, in things coming out of bio and chem and engineering, um, you almost always have to have this, right, these patent rights uh, in, order to, in, order to make that, uh, in order to make that work. Um, and um, I, I guess the last, um, the last point I will make um, is, um, is just a recognition, and I think, I think that our next speaker is going to talk to this a lot, a recognition that um, getting getting your intellectual property rights are really just one step in that process. Uh, and when the government grants your patent or you register your copyright, you haven't, uh, nobody is at that point coming and saying, and here's your $10,000 or here's your million dollars. Rather, right, you have this patent which gives you rights, but you still have to figure out how, does the, how is that a value proposition and is going to help Right, end up resulting in, in revenue or establishing a business, uh, and so right, and so and there's still a lot of work that comes after that. Uh, so I think I'll stop, uh, and uh, we can take. Well, well, Dr. Foley, should we? Are we going to go straight to the next speaker, or I think you can take or, or may, and maybe there's maybe I answered them already. Okay, we're good. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I think you walked off with my notes. Oh, wait. Oh, your notes. <laughs> you want your notes. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Everybody doing okay? Okay. So um, we've seen a lot describing intellectual property, and there's there's a lot of pieces that come together in the in the overall business. And Hank had mentioned a couple of examples, and um, uh, just just to give you an idea, he talked a little bit about Rail, and I might just give you just just a little bit of information about that because it does relate to, to IP. And it was a startup from the university. So what you had is you had several faculty members in the College of Veterinary Medicine that ended up uh, coming up with a way to, to deal with uh, 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 research animal diagnostics and, and doing some tests and so forth on them. And so they began to do that kind of internally, and then it continued to grow, where they began to start doing it externally. And, the, and it, it was all inside the university. It continued to grow. It operated basically like a mini company with inside the university. And it grew and grew. And they actually uh, ended up being, uh, depending on how people would count it from time to time, either number one or number two in the market. I mean, that's how large that, 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 that it grew to. And they then decided they would like to go international and start having operations um, in Europe and other places. And you can see the scope of this is getting to be quite complex for a university. And so for a multitude of reasons, the university decided to sell it. 
And so we had to go through a process where we kind of had to um, uh, uh, separate Siamese twins because they were using part of the university and yet they were a company and so things such as the accounting system and some of the payroll and some of those things were all like this. So we literally had to kind of pry it apart and, and recreate it in order to, to sell it and we went out and sold it. Now, the reason why I mention this is, is because it does relate to IP. So here is a company that has significant sales um, in the um, eight figures and they are, they are selling their services and so we get ready to sell that. Well, what, are they, what do you think they, they want to know about when we get down to starting the sale price? What's the intellectual property? Well, we said, well, yeah, what would you think? Any ideas? I mean, what do you think? You think there's a lot of intellectual property there? In which bucket? They had the four circles up there? The interesting thing is, in the case of Radial, the primary thing we had was trade secrets. And everybody would have thought there would have been a lot of patents and so forth, and there really wasn't. Because what, what these faculty had done is they were always building a new test, a new method of doing that test, and then uh, they were just always constantly creating a better way to do it, which is a trade secret, just constantly doing this over and over again. But the competition, it would take the competition about a year to constantly re-engineer what they were doing to catch up with them. So they were always kind of ahead. With regard to sell, you know, well, what about the patents? Well, we really don't have any patents. Okay, and you want how much for this? But we had trade secrets. The other thing is we had a copyright I said, well, well, that's it. Well, we just wrote a little internal program of how we kind of manage stuff through in, in, in the company. Once again, not anything too significant, just a lot of really smart people knowing how to continually to do things. And of course, what we ended up doing is we ended up selling Radle for $43 million, and we kept the building. So, so Radle had generated enough money that they built the building out at Discovery Ridge, and so today they were set. Now, why would a company do that? Well, was a, there were several reasons. It was a strategic partnership in that the company that bought it, IDEX, was wanting to kind of be in this area and also was very attractive to the idea that they wanted to go international. And they were an international animal health company. So to them, they were buying market share. We had a good customer base. Uh, it was a, a company that generated a nice revenue return and it had these secrets and it had these people. So, so when you put all that together, it, it, it was a really good package for them. The other things they wanted is they wanted to make sure that the people went, the key people. So you talk about uh, employment agreements and all of those aspects, those all became very important. And so they wanted to make sure that those individuals got stock options in it because they wanted them vested because guess what? The unique value in that situation was the, the knowledge of those people and what they did. Now, the interesting thing, you brought up a question earlier about students. Students worked, grad students and everybody, all worked in that. So there was a lot of know-how. The reality is none of the students really worked in all of the pieces to totally figure all of it out. So that may be a strategy of how you use students, but they were all kind of used. But to, to get the whole picture, it was kind of interesting. So the reason why... Uh, I wanted to share that is it kind of gives you a context that based upon the company, some companies, if you didn't have the patent, it would be you wouldn't have a company, period. Some of them, it's, it's, uh, you, uh, you stacked them all together. And that's a very good picture. Those vary in importance based upon the company, and it's important to remember how they fit together. So um, there's a lot of definitions, but, but I kind of like this one because it kind of brings together a couple of kind of key elements about intellectual property, and this is from Cornell uh, University Law School Legal Information Institute. It said, IB, IP is any product of the human intellect. And what do we have at the university? A lot of human intellect. We have a lot of very smart people who are doing some amazing things. That the law protects from unauthorized use. So there is some protection. You know, you can get, allow people to use it. Um, by others. The ownership of the IP inherently creates a limited monopoly 
in the protected property. And then, of course, the IP is traditionally compromised, uh, composed of the, the four that we, uh, was discussed earlier, patent, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. Now, let's talk about the, how things kind of work in the real world is there's a lot of fuzzy front end, and that is not meant to be derogatory. But as we all know, as we come up with ideas, some of that happens in the shower, or you wake up in the middle of the night, or you have the eureka moment in the lab. It all kind of bounces around, and there's all sorts of stuff taking place where you're trying to identify an opportunity, where you're trying to figure out if this is an innovation, and then it kind of begins to settle down, and you become more crystal clear about what you think you have there. You begin to kind of come up with that concept, that idea. And it's really at that point when you begin to ask yourself, do I have something? And when, when you hit that point, that's when we, we start with like the disclosure. That will be discussed a little bit later. But it's when you're trying to figure out what do you have there. And then you begin to figure out, is there something that's protectable? Because it being protectable is very important. And then, of course, that's kind of where uh, a lot of time from faculty, we're, we're kind of spending our... Our, our time in that fuzzy area with things kind of bouncing around. And then all of a sudden we have the idea, we've disclosed it. And so guess what? It's a piece of cake. Now I've decided, I've, I've created this great idea. Now all somebody's got to do is just put it into the marketplace. Just that's it. So the idea, of course, should be worth millions upon millions upon billions of dollars because all that's left is get it into the marketplace. But the reality looks a little bit different is that back here on the back side, you have the idea. Then there's a whole lot of work. And we saw uh, Bill Turpin talking about you know, uh, looking at your business plan. But you've got to begin to look at market research. You've got to be start thinking about planning and strategy. You've got development, trying to figure out the features. You've got to come up with resources. You're going to have to work through the whole commercialization plan. And depending, depending on the company, it's huge. I mean, the amount of effort that it takes. So the idea is hard, and it takes quite a bit of innovation there. But to get to market is a lot of effort. And so even though this starts over here, all of this piece over here, and getting from point A to B requires a lot of money. And depending on the, the industry, for example, if you're trying to take a, bro, a, a drug to market, it's not uncommon for it to cost you a billion dollars, and that is with a B. So based upon that, it takes a lot. So why would anybody do that? The only reason why somebody would put tons of money in there is for return on investment. So that kind of looks like a slot machine and in such ways. That's what they're doing, whether it's angel investors, venture capitalists, all, uh, all of those individuals. They're willing to put the money in because they believe when they pull the lever and all of this work that we've described is done, at the end of the day, they're going to get a return on their investment that pays their money back and allows them to, allows them to reap additional uh, profits for their benefit. Now... I kind of like to share that because I think it's important to understand the perspective as a faculty member because sometimes we forget about all the work that has to occur after that. Now, what I'd like to do is bring Luis up, who hasn't forgot about all of the work because uh, Luis is operating Eternogen, and Eternogen is, uh, started through the biodesign working, and it also, uh, which includes a, an engineer, a doc, and, and an MBA type. And then they worked with a faculty member, Dr. Sheila Grant, which had technology. And uh, Luis uh, was getting his MBA at EMU, the, the first president of Klein in the starting of that student entrepreneur organization, and came on board. So they had the idea. And so Luis, as CEO, has been working on all of these little details at the end, right? So Luis, why don't you, you come on up, and we'll give you this microphone. We're just going to kind of do this as a little bit of an, no, I didn't want to come out. There you go. Thank now you look you, like a jazz singer. Yeah, I might take this off. Oh, you got it out? Okay, good. Yep. So, Louise, wh why don't you just tell us a little bit about Eternogen and its start and what you're doing now? 
Great. You know, the details at the back end. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Uh, I really appreciate the, the introduction and opportunity to share with you guys today. Um, you know, I guess in an innovation, when you said the fuzzy line, you really need one line to come out of that fuzz and you make a big, big difference. And so maybe, you know, for you guys, we have a limited number of people here, but one person to make that line would make a big home run. Um, our, our company is called Eternal Gen, and it really originated from the biological engineering department. Um, kind of walking through the whole life cycle here, it's pretty interesting. The idea came on, why don't we use the most abundant protein in the body, collagen, and, and conjugate it with nanoparticles and make materials that last longer and are um, biologically stimulating for regeneration. And so that sounds like a really nice thesis, something for a biological engineer professor to start researching on. Well, they found out this goo that is not really the basis for Eternogen um, met those criteria. And when it went through biologic, the biodesign program, it was a matter of, okay, let's start analysis and planning. Let's, let's try to figure out where this would be most useful, how we can get it there. And interestingly enough, it was a market that the professor had never heard of, well, had heard of, but was really what people think of, you know, with aesthetic medicine, plastic surgery. Um, well, it, it turns out that to bring a product to market, you need what Steve was talking about in terms of billions. <laughs> and that's a little bit hard to do here from within the Midwest or Colombia. And so we figured that there's a market, there's a need, and that met that criteria that also Bill Turbin was talking about in terms of a small opportunity that could grow big. Currently, there is no collagen in the market for aesthetic medicine. It was originally the first used material and it got superseded by synthetic products because of limitations of technology. So we've honed into that market opportunity and start raising funds around that. So we got our first round of funding in 2012. It was a half a million dollar. It's like, okay, let's start commercialization. Well, it turns out this idea had a lot of work still to be done for it to become a product. And we started optimization. It was mind boggling. <laughs> All the different parameters that we hadn't even thought about uh, for really making this material, biomaterial, uh, a product. And you know, within that, you know, long story short, we've actually secured a second technology in. We've done um, spin outs from the parent company to focus on different industries. And we've done some SBAR applications. Uh, we've raised uh, close to four, uh, well, $3.5 million currently. We're still fundraising. We've done a series of partnerships with uh, companies from uh, creative agencies to do the trademarks and the branding to recently a contract manufacturer to do the manufacturing for us because we are in the incubator currently. We've done clinical trials in Europe. Uh, we're about to finish that. Uh, and so we're really close to getting that product approved. And really, that's reflective on the level of attention to from the strategics that we're having in terms of partnerships or licenses or acquisitions. So we're living kind of the life cycle. And tied in, I guess, to the IP, that was kind of my test of fire. You know, I, a little bit of background myself, I'm a chemical engineer, um, worked with some biotech companies, uh, Johnson & Johnson some, and I was getting my MBA because I wanted to go into entrepreneurship down the road. But it just so happens there's so much intellectual property here, or just intellect, that it sucked me in pretty early. <laughs> and, you know, they were saying, well, you have high aspirations, Luis. That was Sheila Grant, Dave Grant, who are the inventors of technology and the, the team from the biodesign program. Well, why don't you try to create a company, uh, really the only value that that company can have will be that patent application, because they did file for it. And so it started me working with Paul Hippenmeyer, because <laughs> I was sitting over there, I was just a student, and uh, I got the support of uh, Missouri Tech in Incubation uh, Innovation Center to um, negotiate the patent. So they helped me with strategy as well. And sure enough, we were able to license the technology out of the university. That got us, you know, an exclusive license to the, the company. And uh, that allowed us to raise the funds as well. So uh, that was how we really created the value. And, you know, Eternal Gym wouldn't be here if those uh, professors, Dr. Sheila Grant, Dave Grant, didn't take that leap of faith and say, let's go ahead and file a patent. It's, it's kind of early. It's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be complicated, but let's take that step. Let's take that step forward and see what happens. And, you know, my life has been transformed. We have about 12 employees. 
we have big vision. And, you know, I, I was kind of shy about using a success perspective because we're still in it. But we're living basically, you know, what we always envision as entrepreneurial kind of uh, experience. So, Louise, we, as you've raised uh, approximately over $3 million, when you sit across the, the, the desk or table from an angel investor or VC, um, I'm sure they ask you about your IP. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience is that you've had several times where they're wanting to know, okay, so do we really have this limited monopoly so that I have a chance to get my money back? Yeah, I mean, that's the core. That's always a slide. There's 10 slides in a, in a business plan presentation or a pitch for investment, and one of them has to be what is intellectual property. Because like Bill Turpin said, there's big giant gorillas around the world, and if there's an opportunity, they want to go in there. So your biggest uh, ability to break through that the monopoly is to have your own. And so the intellectual property is very key, and it's a long, lengthy process. I don't know if everybody realizes how long it takes. Uh, for you to have actually one patent issued um, in different territories. You could probably be four years if you're optimistic. <laughs> and so um, we have been in still provisional patent uh, level, but we've taken some strategic moves to be able to uh, de-risk de the situation a little further. So uh, just to expand a little bit, uh, when you first apply a patent, right, uh, after a certain time, it becomes non-provisional and be believe it, it publishes. Some people might argue you don't you can have the option in not publishing. But at that time, if you're doing patent collaboration treaty, you can uh, respond to their observations, the PCT observations, and try to get a preliminary patentability report. So mo sometimes people say, well, this is a, the international scale. is really not being nationalized in the country. Let's just wait until we have countries nationalized. But we really went really hard into that, and we got a positive patentability report which meant we don't have a patent issue in any country. But there's this organization that said, this is probably patentable material. And with that, we would have been able to, to raise the funds. You know, just to talk about the impact of the value of IP, we were in the last really stages of negotiation for a partnership. And they've already said how much they were going to put. And uh, these companies, they had a restructuring. They got a new uh, management in. And he you know, looked at our portfolio and said, you don't have a patent issued yet. I cannot approve this. And so the CEO changed his mind, you know, because I haven't had a patent issued yet. We have a, some, a couple of patents applied in a good perspective, but it hadn't issued yet. So that's how, you know, groundbreaking that factor is. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions? I can ask you more questions, but does anybody have any questions for Luis? And uh, he's in the, the midst of this. Luis, while they're thinking of a question, you might talk a little bit about, so uh, Dave and Sheila Grant are faculty members at the University of Missouri. They were the ones that created the, um, uh, the IP uh, that, ha that your company's been founded upon. Uh, but they're still doing research. And, and so how, how is Sheila, and, and, and for faculty, how are they able to continue their, their work at the university and doing research and still interface with uh, your company? Because they still have... Uh, have a, a kind of limited role with the company. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the university has a framework that's very conducive for this. Um, uh, they, you know, faculty have, I think, 20% to do consulting. But it's a matter of where you invest that consulting time. Um, so f with them, uh, they take a trip, three-minute trip down to the incubator for weekly meetings. And, you know, we have research going on there. And they are a signatory authority in our company in terms of management. So they've been able to leverage that really neatly. So it's kind of like in this kind of process, you have the, uh, the stage where it is in the lab, and then there's a stage where it matures from that. And so it's a matter of uh, you know, uh, conflict of interest management. They're very open with that office, and they say, okay, now at this stage, the patent is, is, is a license. Um, the, they have an infrastructure there. We're about to, we're going to do research there, and, and that's what they do, and they're significantly valuable in our company. You know, uh, they have the academic mindset, and so that allows us to be more, even more creative, too, with coming up with additional innovations. So um, it's a wonderful relationship, and I, I think, uh, you know, faculty here, um, you know, could really, you know, take a sense of kind of shifting their, their uh, 
modus operandi or the way that their daily lifestyle looks like. So why not in my 20% actually take a trip to go visit my company or the people who are working day and night out uh, on commercializing my innovation? That's, that's pretty neat, I think. So, you know, from a faculty member's perspective, the, the thing to realize is that that creative idea, that thing that's kind of been bouncing around in your head as you've been in your lab work, as that moves forward, it gets disclosed, there's some protection that's put in place. Faculty members do have choices. They don't necessarily have to uh, take that all the way down the road, start their own company and do all that. They can do things where you can have like a CEO, which is what Luisa has, has come into that company. He takes the, the business lead, moving the company forward along with the employees, but Sheila and David are still able to be a part of that, but yet they're still very much a part of the faculty here at MU and very much able to continue moving their research forward and continuing to move forward. We probably have time for one question. Anyone have a question? If not, uh, any last words, Luis, you want to? share before we move on to the next one? Well, um, no, I'd just uh, like to encourage everybody to take that first step, that leap of faith. And I think if you're here, they're probably already there. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of thinking about entrepreneurship, one thing I, I like to share a lot is um, what uh, Missouri Innovation Center taught me when I was in the business plan competition down in that building. Jake Halliday was the, basically Bill Turpin at that time. But he defined entrepreneurship as the ability to take – the risk at moving something forward without real hard um, emphasis or evaluation of the resources that it takes to get it there. That's how he defines entrepreneurship. It's like, you know what? It's going to take $5 million. Well, I don't have them right now, but so what? I'm going to start walking. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, if you're here, you might think about entrepreneurship, and that's kind of what it takes. Don't let the big mountain in front of you deter you from starting to take those steps. Because as you start taking those steps, you can start seeing the way and things kind of just, you know, clear up. And, you know, from people who have, might have mathematics here, I, I really like this analogy of, you know, the uh, central limit theorem. All your little decisions, if you take an average of 32, and if you're in the right path, take you to the right direction. So little by little, these little steps that you're taking in terms of moving a commercial, commercial entity forward end up taking you to the right place um, by just taking smaller decisions. So that entails applying for a, a patent or, you know, founding a company, looking for your partners, um, and the whole pathway. So I, I thank you for your time here. Oh. You know, I think what you're saying is so important. Just, just a second. Yeah, sure. Real quick. The recording. There you go. Thank you for saying that, Luis, because, you know, as faculty members, we spend a great deal of time contemplating on the fact that our research is not far enough to be meaningful to anyone. We haven't addressed this confounding variable or that confounding variable. We focus an awful lot in the research world on what's missing <laughs> in the literature and in the science and in the knowledge base. And so I really appreciate you turning that around to say, okay, <laughs> Let's, go. Let's go. Let's not focus in the weeds. Let's get out of the weeds yeah. and get into the bigger picture. The bigger Thank picture. you for that. Thank you very much, yeah. Just to tie in with the IP that is the commercial approach to that is completely opposite to the faculty approach to it. They're like, how many patents can I have? Apply for them. And, you know, we've taken that sometimes. It's like, well, we just started with this invention. Let's apply. And it's like a three-page patent application. It's provisional. You're just saying, here's the concept. I, I'm going to develop. You have 12 months. So make, <laughs> make that provisional there. Secure your rights. Have those 12 months to expand on it. And, you know, and then you have something pretty good worthwhile. Let's give Louise a big round of applause. Thank you. And next up is uh, Scott Ullman. morning. My name is Scott Woolman. I'm the uh, Assistant Vice President for Innovation and Economic Development at the UM System. Um, I report to, I guess, Interim President, Vice President, Vice Chancellor for Research, Dr. Hank Foley. 
I think he has more titles than Netflix does. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, this morning about the university's intellectual property policies. Uh, you might consider this talk kind of cleansing the palate between the really interesting talks. But uh, hopefully you'll have some uh, good information to take away and, and uh, you'll become a little more familiar with what uh, your rights are as a faculty member with respect to intellectual property that you develop. So there are at least five attorneys in the room, so I need to start with a disclaimer that uh, this presentation is an overview. The uh, collected rules supersede any interpretation I give, so I hope that covers me. No, is, is it picking this up? Does that work? Okay. So the, the two policies I'm going to be talking about are Chapter 100, Patent and Copyright Policy, or sorry, Patent and Plant Variety uh, Regulations, and 100.030 Copyright Regulations. I'll start first with the uh, patent policy. Um, as was alluded to earlier, the uh, patent policy uh, forms a part of the uh, employment contract. Uh, it applies to all inventions and plant varieties made during any period of employment with the, within the university. So who's considered an employee under the, pa the patent policy? Any person receiving compensation from the university for services rendered, regardless of whether it's full-time, and any person receiving compensation, or any person receiving compensation paid through the hands of the university from any, I'm sorry, paid through the university from any funds placed in the hands uh, for distribution. Or uh, any person who voluntar voluntarily elects to be treated as an employee under the patent policy. And a, a situation where that might occur is if a, um, a person has some IP that the university doesn't otherwise have rights to, and for some reason, uh, the university and this ind individual um, are willing to uh, agree that the university will be assigned that IP, then the, in exchange for that assignment, the university would treat that individual as an employee, and then the uh, uh, patent policy would apply. So the rights of the university and its employees, the university owns any invention developed in the course of the employment. Um, each employee is required to assign to the university uh, any invention or plant variety that they develop unless the university has agreed to uh, waive the invention. Um, and the employee, in exchange for that um, assignment, has a right to share in revenues received by the university if we're able to license it and generate some revenues. And I'll talk about that briefly here in a second. And as I mentioned, the university may elect uh, to waive or assign rights back to the inventors. If the university conducts an evaluation and determines that um, it's not um, in the university's best interest for whatever reason to pursue a patent application, then uh, the university can waive those rights back to the inventor, and then the inventor can go out on their own and seek a patent application if they choose to. Uh, the employee owns... Um, inventions or plant varieties made outside the general scope of the employee's university's duties. So, the, so what's considered the, uh, within the scope of duties? Whenever the university's duties include research or investigation and the invention or plant variety arose in the course of such research and is relevant to the general field of inquiry or whenever the plant or the invention and plant variety was made substan with substantial resources um, at the university or the use of university facilities on university time or through the um, aid of university information not otherwise generally available. So as I mentioned, uh, when the in, uh, faculty member assigns an invention to the university, they have a right to share in revenues. At the university, the uh, revenues are distributed with the inventors receiving a third of uh, all licensed revenues. They, they get that off the top before the university recovers its patent expenses. Um, after the university recovers the expenses associated with uh, seeking uh, uh, patent protection, then those net revenues are d divided equally 
uh, between the originating campus, the department from which the invention resulted, and then the UM system. Plant varieties are a little different. Uh, the inventors receive 10% uh, off the top, then university recovers any revenues, and then 95% goes to the breeding program, and then 5% um, to the uh, university. So I'll talk briefly now about the uh, copyright policy. Um, the policy governs the rights and responsibilities of university employees and students. Uh, using university facilities or research in the creation of original works. Faculty uh, continue to retain ownership of uh, works developed in their roles as teachers and scholars, so textbooks, study guides, and so forth. Uh, faculty continue to own those. The university doesn't have any rights in those. University owns copyrighted materials if they are uh, commissioned for its use or created by the employees if the production of the materials is a specific responsibility of their position or if they're generated through sponsored works such as uh, internal or external grants. Um, but it doesn't apply if the copyright results uh, or the, the resulting cop copyright is ancillary to the purpose of the grant. Um, and as I mentioned, employees continue to own the copyright to scholarly works. Also, if the um, copyright is created with the use of substantial resources uh, provided for the development of those materials, then the um, university will own that. And in those cases, the university would enter into a contract with the employee for the division of revenues um, if any are received for the, uh, through the licensing or commercialization of the uh, work. So software created by non-academic employees. If, if you enter into a, um, an arrangement with, say, university IT department to develop some software, um, those individuals are um, employees of the university. They're doing that work as a specific responsibility of their job. So they wouldn't own the rights to that IP. Um, ownership, in that case, would belong to the or I'm sorry, to the university. Employee isn't deemed an author, and they wouldn't uh, have any right to share in revenue if um, that work is commercialized. Copyright revenues are uh, distributed uh, differently than than uh, patents. Um, it's generally based on a written agreement between the university and the authors. Uh, the policy says that um, at least 50% of the net income will go to the department or area from which the materials were produced, and then 50% shall go to the authors. Um, the university can enter into other agreements for dividing those revenues if um, circumstances warrant. Um, for more information, these are the links. Um, terribly long links to the uh, patent policy and copyright policy and the address for the uh, campus tech transfer office. So if anybody has any questions, we happy to answer. Scott, oh, this is going to be a tough one. Differently than the well, one. I, I think the university has previously said so. Usually, the faculty member who creates a syllabus and puts together their course materials for kind of an ordinary stand up course, that faculty member owns the copyright to those. Right. Um, but what about in, uh, in, in are, are you treating things differently when perhaps um, you university refused university facilities to produce videos? I think there are a lot of aspects to your question. I don't know. Maybe I'll defer to Lana on that. Do you, do you want to be able to? I'm sorry. Lana Nedlick is uh, with the general counsel's office.
probably assert ownership uh, absent some sort of, of written agreement, but it would be governed by the, the existing copyright policy. But, but I, I think the faculty member would still retain ownership of the, 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 the underlying content, content of the course, right? but so, not the online uh, production of it. Yeah, I just wanted to, to clarify. I think the faculty understanding is certainly from the point of view of faculty council is that uh, those are materials we develop just as we develop syllabi, learning materials, and those kinds of things. And, um, and, and clearly, I, I think it would depend on the extent to which those substantial university resources were used and exactly what was used. Probably. Uh, when, there's, when there's intellectual content we develop that is usually in hard copy before it ever gets simply applied to a different technology for delivery, uh, that content is, is um, I think we would think is, is our property. Well, I, I think content. that's right. The content itself would remain the property of the faculty member. It's just the, the, the electronic course, the university would have rights in that. Like, for that. example, Mizzou Online, right? So all of that is supported by and funded by the university and that's sort of outside the normal sort of production of materials. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, next uh, we have Craig David up. Uh, who is the director of the Office of Concert Program and Administration. Well, we dropped the mic, so we're not starting off real well. All right, as Steve indicated, my name's Craig. I am oversee the Office of Sponsored Program, so I'm going to kind of talk about where we fit into all this talk on IP and contracts and, you know, sponsored programs that come to the university and, and what part does that play and how's that changing, you know, since Hank Foley's taken over uh, as the uh, Vice Chancellor of Research, what, what changes can we expect to come? But first of all, you know, I really want to clarify that our Office of Sponsored Programs, we really see ourselves as a service office, you know. we. We, our number one focus is customer service. In addition to that, we're also responsible to protect the university. You know, we're responsible for some compliance issues. You know, a good example is right now we're trying to obtain 7,000 effort verification forms, okay? So anybody's salary that's paid on a federal grant, we have to get them to sign an effort verification form. We're doing that electronically now, but there's absolutely no wiggle room when it comes to that regulation. We have to do that. If we don't do that, we're out of compliance. We put the university at risk. So we have those uh, competing priorities sometimes. On how do we help our investigators and stay in compliance? So we see, we see our role is to help our investigators navigate those hurdles, navigate our internal policies, na navigate the federal regulations. What are they trying to do? What are the objectives? What are the goals? Can we get it done? You know, is there something that we can overlook? Is there something that we can find a different way? Uh, but we're going to work as hard as we can to help the investigator achieve their goals. Uh, so in our office, we, we have the delegated authority to sign contracts on behalf of the curators and bind the curators. We have 37 employees. There's five of us that have signature authority. So we, we're the ones that actually sign the contracts. Any contract that goes through an academic unit, any, any sponsored program, uh, it's going to end up going through our office. And, and I say that uh, in hopes that, that I can relay the importance of get us involved early. You know, so I can't tell you how many times we have an investigator that goes and talks to a company or talks to an entity, says, I got this deal done, and then it gets routed around campus, it goes to Lisa Women at Hours office, it ends up in my shop, and they're like, yeah, it should be in sponsored programs, and they think the deal's done. It's like, okay, did we think about F&A, for example? We got a $100,000 project. Oh, we didn't think about FNA. Well, it's a research project, so now we got 53% FNA. So now we're at 150,000. Well, I've already told them it's 100. Now, now we're in, we're in a bad situation. And, and again, I say that 
uh, the earlier we can get involved, the better. And remember, we're, we'll try to help navigate. You know, we'll, we'll try to help get this thing done. I think a lot of times there's a perception that if we get sponsor programs involved, that there'll be a barrier of some type, or that it'll be more difficult. And so we'll just wait till the end and just drop it, you know, on, on their desk. So we're, we're really there to help. Uh, so since we have that delegated authority to, to find the curators, it's really our offices should be negotiating in good faith because we're the ones that are able to, to, to find the curators. And so here on this fourth bullet point, I kinda, this is, an, is not an exhaustive list, but here's a few items that, that uh, terms and conditions that we end up negotiating, that we end up you know, having to go back and forth with our sponsors. And, and, uh, and let's think of federal funding, first of all. NIH, NSF, how much time do you think we spend negotiating contracts with those guys? You know, anybody? Anybody? Zero. You know, we, we don't. Those are beautiful. That's beautiful funding. We submit a proposal. It's fantastic. The agency says, that is fantastic. We, they send a unilateral award. We don't even sign the agreement. We take the award, and we, and we start uh, working, and we start billing for our, for our expenditures. That pot of money is decreasing, as Hank has indicated, that we're, we're seeking alternative funding all the time. And so there are many types of contracts or funding that we get where we have a contract where we have to look at the terms and conditions. And here's just a few items. Uh, IP we'll talk about a little, little more here in just a second, but legal language, for example. We work with general counsel's office. They'll look at uh, the agreement and say, you know, jurisdiction. And where, if we litigate a sponsored program, by the way, we very, very rarely litigate sponsored programs. Uh, but if we do, where are we going to litigate that? Is it going to be the Netherlands? Is it going to be Missouri? You know, we would like to litigate that in Missouri, if, if possible. And sometimes that will create an impasse. We had, you know, an agreement where the agency said, no, nope, the jurisdiction is going to be the Netherlands, okay? It wouldn't budge. Is either the project was going to die or we're going to accept that clause. So in that situation, just an example, work with general counsel, we work with the dean, we work with the department chair, and get assurances that if we end up litigating this contract and have to go to the Netherlands, are you the PI, are you the chair of the dean, are you willing to, to incur those expenditures to do that? And if they say, sure, then you know, we were able to accept that clause. You know, governing law as well. Are, you know, what law is going to govern? Is it the state of Missouri? Is it uh, Louisiana? Very different law there. Is it another country's law? You know, we, we uh, would negotiate that as well. Indemnification. You know, state law does not allow us to indemnify other entities. So that's another thing that we see in a lot of contracts that we strike out or we add additional language so, so that we can agree to it. Sovereign immunity. We are, we are not subject to be sued in federal court. Now, General Counsel's Office takes that very seriously. We don't waive our sovereign. We have the ability to waive that sovereign immunity if we want to. But that would be an extremely, extremely rare situation where we'd waive our sovereign immunity. Export controls. You know, is there, is there expert controlled uh, technology that we have to worry about? Do we need to get Jennifer May or, or the new Jennifer May, whoever that be? Uh, do we need to get them involved? You know, is there language in there that says we have to identify export controlled material? Uh, we, we get those experts involved. Conflict of interest as well especially with an industry sponsor. Is there a conflict of interest we need to manage? You know, conflicts of interest aren't bad. Uh, we just need to manage them, and that's more for the protection of our investigators or people involved. Publication restrictions, that's a big deal to our investigators, right? The right to publish. You know, do we want to accept a publication restriction? If it's a research project, most likely not. We probably wouldn't want to accept a publication restriction on a research project. Let's say it's another sponsored activity or where they're just giving us some data, we're running a test and pumping some numbers back to them. In that situation, do, could we accept a publication restriction? It's very possible. It's very possible that we would pursue that. And then the authorizations, that's always really interesting, especially on big proposals with a lot of different departments. Who's got to sign that PSRS, you know? The investigators, the co-investigators, all the chairs, all the deans. And once you get it all signed, then we change something, right? We go change the budget or we change the share credit and we start that thing all over again. And, you know, we do that electronically and I think that helps us somewhat, but, uh, you know, that's our role. Make sure that everybody is in agreement before a proposal goes out the door, before an agreement is signed. And so we talked a little bit about the difference in NIH and NSF funding. Uh, when it comes to intellectual property, 
you know, federal funding, do, do we worry about it, IP and, and federal funding? We don't, and, and the reason we don't is the Bayh-Dole Act. The Bayh-Dole Act, I believe, was 1980, went into effect in 1980, and what the Bayh-Dole Act allows us to do is we own any intellectual property that results from federal funding. Okay? Prior to that, we were required to assign that IP or those inventions to the federal government. And what the federal government figured out was they have all these assignments, there's a multitude of patents that the federal government had, and very few, less than 5%, were commercialized. So they, you know, Senators By and Dole figured out, you know, we're not very good at this. You know, we're not very good at commercializing this technology. I think that the universities can do it better. So the By Dole uh, Act went into effect in 1980. And so that's, that was a big game changer. You know, without, without the By Dole Act, we wouldn't have, you know, Brett Malin and Chris Fender in that shop. It would be very different. It uh, wouldn't exist. So... The difference, though, is industry, when we deal with industry, you know, that's not the case. We don't automatically own any IP. Generally, any industry contract we're going to sign, it's, it's going to need to be addressed, or industry is going to want to see it addressed. And usually, industry is going to say, hey, we're paying you for a service, or we're paying you for research, so we should own the rights to any intellectual property that results. And historically, our university and other universities have said, we take the first approach, no, we should own the intellectual property. And then we have to negotiate back and forth. And sometimes that can be very frustrating to our investigators because industry likes to get contracts done quickly. And it can take a significant amount of time to negotiate IP. And a lot of times we'd hear from our investigators, I'm not going to generate any intellectual property. This is a service agreement. You know, I, there is no IP. And it would still stall the contract. So some of the changes that we have going on now is we're not taking the initial approach or the initial stance that, hey, we need to own intellectual property when it comes to industry. You know, we want to we engage the investigator and ask the investigator, is there going to be any intellectual property? If there's not, or the investigator doesn't have any IP that they want to protect, then let's go ahead and waive our IP up front. Let's not, let's not negotiate that. Let's get, the, let's get the contract in place. But I want to be real clear that we're not, we're not encouraging people to say, hey, you should waive your IP so you can get your contract in place really quickly. You know, if there's language in there that, that uh, or if you think there's intellectual property that's going to be generated from the research that we need to protect, then we want to do that. You know, we want to get language in there to protect any intellectual property. You know, we want to make sure that the language in there doesn't, isn't too far reaching, that it doesn't go into background intellectual property, or wouldn't try to grab intellectual property that's not related to the project. So we're still going to review the language. And uh, we work pretty closely with Lana at times, and my office is the one that, that negotiates that language. So we, we you know, we're, we're big on policies here at MU. So we drafted a policy that basically just states what, what I stated, that we're going to allow the investigators to, to, to make that determination whether or not to, to protect intellectual property. So at the same time, you know, when we go back, to this list here of all these different types of terms. I mean, the world would be a really beautiful place if we never had to negotiate those terms. If we had a contract, a standard contract in place that everybody could agree to all the time. You know, that, that's never going to happen. But we tried to put together an agreement that we could work with industry that we feel is pretty friendly to industry that says, okay, you can own the intellectual property up front. You know? uh, but one thing we do is in that standard contract is we retain our publication rights. And so what, what our policy states is if we waive our IP rights up front, that we should get an additional 5% F&A. You know, and, and so that's what we do. Where does that 5% go? You know, it goes into the general pool. It doesn't, doesn't fund my salary or anybody else's. Uh, currently, it goes into the, the general pool with the rest of the F&A. All right, so let me I mean, let's say we start using these contracts and the industry, you know, uh, really likes the contract or standard contract and everybody agrees it's within the policy. Does that mean that my office, those five people that have signature authority can go ahead and ink that contract? You know, we can't. And the reason being is uh, uh, Scott was talking about the collected rules, but the collected rules only allow the president or his designee to waive IP. So if we're, if we're going to enter into that contract, we still need to fill out an intellectual property waiver form. 
Okay, and that has to be signed, and the contract has that signed by Hank Foley's that designee, and now also that uh, has been delegated to the chancellor as well. We recently used the chancellor to sign a contract, but currently those contracts are still going through Hank Foley's office. And so the uh, bottom line is you work with the sponsor programs, we'll work with you to get that thing signed and or to get it processed. But if we're using our standard contract as an industry sponsor, you know, there's, it, it's more of a formality to get that, that contract signed. A uh, million dollar question, you know, how long does it take? I mean, that's what investigators want to, that's what industry wants to know. If I, if I come to work with one of your investigators, how long is it going to take me to get a contract in place? How long is it going to take before we can start work? You know, and, and that's, that's a great question, and it really depends. You know, if we, can, if we can agree on all the terms and conditions up front, it can happen really fast. We can get a contract through our office in a day or two. You know, if we're going to be, if we're going to take really rigid stances on some of those, those terms, you know, it can take a long time, you know, and it could be a deal breaker either for industry or for our investigator. You know, if our investigator indicates I need to publish, I have to publish this data, it's important to me, uh, and, and the sponsor doesn't want to do that, that's an impasse, you know, that, that we might not be able to get over. So delays can occur, you know, but, but one thing I want to assure you of is that our office recognizes, you know, the importance of getting that contract in place with the industry and the speed that that needs to be done, and, uh, you know, we'll work We'll work to negotiate and get those things executed as quickly as possible. So the takeaway points today, and again, I really want to emphasize that we're very customer service driven. We want to help our investigators, you know, get done whatever they need to get done. You know, and we're also, we want to empower our investigators to make those informed decisions on whether or not we need to protect intellectual property when it comes to contracts. So we really want to engage the investigator early to help us make those decisions. And we're trying to simplify the procedures, come up with standard documents, you know, uh, more, more uh, quick procedures and processes to get those contracts in place as quick as possible. Last slide here is my contact information and others in my office. You can contact us anytime. Questions? Anybody have questions? Yes, ma'am. Sorry to take advantage of the fact that there aren't too many faculty here and to have the opportunity to speak with you. But, but I just want to um, say thank you because I think that your team is the utmost of professional and, you know, it's a pleasure to work with them. And so, and, and OSPA just does a wonderful job. I really have been grateful over 15 years of working with you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's really great. And then the question I had, though, is how have things changed since um, now interim president, et cetera, et cetera, Hank Foley came on board? Oh, that's a pretty loaded question, how things changed. Well, no, I mean, it, you know, it is because yeah. from our side of the fence, it's hard to, to know what those things, I know there are many, many things happening, and I'm sure they're, they're not visible to all of us down here on the, this level of food chain. Sure. And I, you know, I, I think the biggest change is, is, is Hank's approach to IP that he promotes and talks about all the time and that, that we, we reiterate as well. But also, I, I think uh, Dr. Foley's a lot more open to, you know, what do we need to do? You know, is there a rule? Is there a, a policy we need to change? And I'll give you an example. Like we used to have a, a BPM 203, the, the, the business policy manual 203 that indicated, you know, you, yeah, if you did... Uh, work with industry and you waived IP, you had to have 200 percent F and A, you know, and, and that's a business policy manual and that's what it states. And so, you know, previously we'd get something come through and we'd say, nope, it violates BPM 203, we can't do it, you know, and, and Hank's very logical. And if we approach Hank and say, you know, this, this rule is ridiculous, you know, that, that, is there something we need, do we need to change the rule? You know, can we overlook the rule? Do we, do we need to work with general counsel and get their approval? If it just makes sense to get a deal done, you know, he's going to do anything he can and support my office in making those decisions to help the investigators get those deals done. And, you know, and I think everybody's aware of, of the need to, you know, elevate our research expenditures, you know. So I, I think the biggest change is, you know, we're going to do everything we can to get deals done and get projects in the door so that we can, we can have research expenditures and, 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 and increase those expenditures. 
Other questions? All right, thank you all. Okay, thank you, Craig. Next up, we have uh, identifying IP and navigate, whoops, I'm sorry, University Technology and Transfer with Paul Hibbemeyer and uh, Anna Nedlick. Sure. My name is Diana Knedlik. Um, I'm in the General Counsel's office. I've been, are you getting feedback? Or is it just Paul? Um, I, I've been at the university for about a year and a half. Prior to that, I was in uh, private practice in Kansas City for about 15 years. Uh, I have a, a, a technical background, and most of my area focuses on the patent and software area. I do a little bit of copyright in the context of the software um, some of those inventions, um, but primarily most of the copyright work, which sort of goes to the educational materials questions, is, is handled by another lawyer um, in our office, uh, Nancy Hawk. So, yeah, I'm Paul Lippenmeyer. I work with uh, our tech transfer organization here, uh, and what we want to do today is introduce you a little bit about that process. And so it's. It's sort of summarized in a, in a couple words there in the, the subtitle, and that's to identify intellectual property, uh, assess uh, what it is, uh, how we need to protect it, uh, then go out and find, a, find somebody to make a product out of it. The university isn't in the business of doing products. We do education research, extension, um, business development, but we don't actually make a whole lot of products and then complete a licensing deal with that entity out there that, that will give us some rights uh, back in product flow and royalties at the end of the day. My personal background is in drug discovery. I have a PhD in cell and molecular biology, a little bit more recent MBA degree. Uh, spent a long time doing drug discovery research before coming here about five years ago. So, um, so you're out there working in the lab, you say, gosh, have I invented something yet? Well, come talk to us early and often. Uh, like Craig said, we're a service organization. We want to help you guys understand the process and, and be able to navigate through it appropriately. So there's, yeah, an invention's got a couple parts. One is the conception of the idea. You know, what is it? Who thought of it? Uh, it's it's got to work, really. So it's, it's got to be more than just an idea. We can't patent uh, ideas. Uh, you have to show how it works, and you have to show the best mode, and that's part of the deal with patents in particularly. You have to be able to let other people use it. So you have to write down how it works, when it works, what conditions you use, and allow the, the public to use it. And for that, that description, you get a 20-year sort of monopoly, if you will, on excluding others from using that same uh, intellectual property. So how does the process start? We start with an invention disclosure. So this is an internal document. It it's, uh, uh, gets the ball rolling for us. And certainly you can come and talk to us before this at any time. Uh, talk to us early and often. And, and we can help you through this. So the invention disclosure outlines what the invention is, uh, title, summary, data. Maybe it's a manuscript that's about to go out. You know, It's got all the information in there. You can append that to it. You don't have to rewrite it. Um, have you publicly discussed this invention with somebody else outside of a, a confidentiality agreement, for instance? We need to know that because that has certain implications for patentability uh, down the road. Uh, have you given, you know, this could be in the form of an abstract uh, lecture somewhere or, or just a discussion with some industry colleagues at a bar, uh, or it could be a blog or a patent or a thesis filed. Uh, so all these things uh, can count as public disclosures and have impl implications for protecting intellectual property. Uh, how is it funded? Uh, uh, Craig talked about federal funding. We have to report due to Bayh-Dole uh, compliance issues. We have to report uh, when we receive patent uh, or invention disclosures from federally funded research. Uh, was it uh, industry sponsored or not? All this has to go into inventorship and ultimately ownership of that IP. 
What's the commercial potential? Uh, you guys are pretty close to this. You guys are working in the labs. Uh, uh, we cover a lot, of, a lot of breadth and depth in our department. We're not experts on everything. So some hints as to, well, who might use this? What's this good for? You know, that always helps our evaluation process and gets the ball rolling. Has anybody else come up with something close to this uh, before that you're aware of? We'll, we'll do our searches, but it helps if you kind of lead us in the right direction for doing that. And then finally, who are the contributors? So this helps us determine inventorship. So inventorship's hard to do uh, up front before we really have you know, that patent issued technically. It's, I mean, we need to know what the issue claims are. Um, but we need to know who's contributed to this, and so we can go back and, and figure out who the inventors are at the end of the day. They may be students, they may be other faculty. Uh, we have invention disclosures from one person or teams of people. So uh, we need to know who that is. And we also need to know if there are any non-university inventors or contributors to the, uh, to the invention as well. So here's uh, sort of what we do with the process. It starts with the invention disclosure I just described. We look at it, make sure it's in compliance. We need the hard copy signature uh, version of this. Um, we do a couple main analyses. One's a patentability analysis. And so the main aspects of a patent And so it, it's got to be novel, it's got to have some usefulness, and it's got to be non-obvious, and it's got to be reduced to practice and enabled, as I spoke about before. So we review your invention disclosure for those qualities to try to say, hey, is this something that's patentable or not? Um, and that we work with the inventors to discuss these things. Uh, we also do a marketability analysis. So this is kind of step two, and these, these go in parallel. And so you can have things that are patentable, certainly. They're new. They're useful uh, to someone, anyway. Uh, they're non-obvious in that they're more than just an incremental improvement in the art. But is somebody really going to buy this on the marketplace? Is anybody out there in that commercial space interested in this. So we wanted to know what the market size is, uh, competitive advantage of this technology over what already exists out there. And so this process sort of results in a strategy for commercial, commercialization for each invention disclosure. And that takes into account a patent strategy, a licensing strategy, and, and what we call a marketing strategy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the patent application process. Um, here at the university, we typically start with a filing of a, a provisional application. And, and I think Dennis and Luis talked a little bit about what that is. But it's, it's basically a, a placeholder um, patent application that we typically would do in-house. Um, and we file that in-house because it's a lot more cost-effective. And in addition, there might be a situation in which an inventor is getting ready to go to a symposium or publish, and it's just a lot easier for us to do that initial filing in-house. But what that is is a placeholder for up to a year to convert the provisional to a non-provisional application. And that non-provisional is actually what would be examined by the, the patent office. And during that one-year period, you know, is, is really when um, Paul's office is going to be sort of assessing in more detail um, perhaps what the, the prior art looks like. In other words, how broad or narrow were, will our ultimate patent be? What is the commercial potential? What is the market potential? So that, that one-year period buys us a, a little bit of time. Um, when we get to the non-provisional stage, um, those are exclusively handled by outside patent counsel. Um, and we engage, um, I don't know, roughly 15 to 20 different firms um, to handle those um, filings. And, and while there's sort of a preference for Missouri firms, we really want to engage lawyers who have the appropriate um, technical background to uh, understand the invention and to work with the inventor to, to get that non-provisional on file. The, the patent application itself is a written document. 
Um, in some ways, it reads a lot like a, a technical paper. There'll be a specification, which would include the materials and, and methods and, and um, working examples. That specification would also have drawings and figures and, and the data and results. Um, and then at the end of the, the patent application itself are these numbered paragraphs called the claims. And those are really what define the invention. Um, and, and those are really the most important part of the patent application itself because you want to have those claims broad enough to um, um, sort of encompass other ways to design around your invention, so alternative embodiments for, for how you might approach the invention. But yet you want them to be narrow enough so that they don't inadvertently read on the prior art. They don't inadvertently capture what's been done before so that you have novelty and non-obviousness sort of issues. So there's a lot of work and a lot of back and forth between the lawyer and the inventors to sort of come up uh, with those claims. Um, just a little bit more about the, the, the overall process. So once that, that patent application is on file, um, it will be examined by the, the patent office. And that process is called patent prosecution and is really a, a, a give and take. Um, typically, the, the patent office will uh, reject the application for one or more reasons. Then you, as the university and the inventor, have an opportunity to sort of respond and say why you think the invention's patentable and maybe distinguish that prior art. Um, but as Louise mentioned further, it really is, it, it takes a long time. I mean, the patenting process is an investment. I think the average time from filing to issuance is, I don't know, three to four years, depending on, on the art area that you're in. So this is, uh, this is all part of the process of the patent strategy that Lana talked about. Um, certainly involves filing the, the provisional, but then there's broader questions. What, what other countries do we want to file in? How much is it going to cost? Is it worth it? Is there a market in those other countries for the product? There may or may not be. Uh, you don't want to file everywhere if there's no market there. Uh, really, the only reason, you know, from my perspective, to file a, you know, get started down the patent process is because there is a market. It's not a vanity thing to put on a CV. It's nice, sure, but really it's going to cost a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort. So really the only uh, real criteria for moving forward is, is knowing that there is a market for this at the end of the day. And that's hard to do. A lot of what you guys do is early cutting edge research. It's hard to know standing here today what that's going to look like in two, five, ten years down the road. So it's a, it's a tough decision to make. Uh, we also come up with a licensing strategy, again, driven somewhat by the market. Uh, should we li license it in an exclusive or non-exclusive way? That is just one company or many companies. Research tools, we often do many companies. Something that's very unique, high value, we may do to just one company. Uh, we talked, uh, Louis talked about a startup experience. Uh, we can license to established companies. Although as Bill talked about, kind of the food chain of things is large companies are sort of risk averse. They don't invest early. Uh, they'll wait for a startup to bring that technology forward to a certain point and then buy the company. Uh, next slide, please. And so there's, there's several outcomes of the process. Um, we start with this, this overall strategy. We'll look at it and say, yep, it's ready to go market. We'll try to sell this technology. Uh, or maybe it's not ready. We hold it for additional research. Or sometimes, you know, there's nothing novel there. We can't patent this. We need to uh, move on. We're going to wave that back. Or sometimes we have a licensee, oftentimes a startup, uh, kind of waiting in the wings. If we do marketing, the, the whole focus of the marketing effort is to find a licensee, uh, which has you know, one of two outcomes. Uh, sometimes we try and try and try, and we can't find anybody. Nobody's stepping forward. At that time, we'll also offer the rights to the IP back to the inventors. Um, Reevaluate at a certain point, uh, and then for every license we do, there's post-transaction monitoring. Are they in compliance with their license agreement? Are they paying us what they're supposed to be paying us? Are they giving us reports when they're supposed to do that? So that also uh, takes time uh, and effort on the part of our office. So 
really quickly, we have about 200 active licenses uh, in play right now. Uh, we bring, brought in about $10 million last year in royalty income from these different licenses. Uh, we typically get 70, 80, 90 new invention disclosures a year from groups like you who say, hey, I think we've invented something. That springs this whole process forward. Uh, we file a fair number of provisional patents on those 85. And last year was uh, pretty good. We had 36 new uh, applications issued. Uh, uh, now again, because of the process, these started many years, uh, often before uh, issuance, three, four, five years uh, prior. Uh, the effort is uh, results in some substantial income. Uh, in the case of a you know, multi-billion dollar enterprise, it's not a whole lot, but you drill down to the level of the investigator, to the level of their departments. Uh, we brought in nearly $78 million in royalties over the last 10 years. And if you look at the economic impact broadly, how are we benefiting the citizens of the state of Missouri, the citizens of the world who get to use these products that are invented here? Uh, those product sales have exceeded uh, $1 billion over the last 10 years. So thing, it does make a difference. Uh, these things do get out there. It's a hard, kind of torturous process at times, but, uh, but it really pays off, especially if it's a new drug and you have that ailment. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to talk a little bit more about, uh, about what our office does. We have about 11 attorneys in our office, and um, it's, it's sort of interesting because in my prior life, all that I really did was, uh, not all, but I, I focused on um, patent prosecution and sort of helping our inventors um, obtain patents. Um, and we use, again, outside counsel for most of that work. So primarily what I do and what some of the other lawyers in our office do is a lot of the agreement transactional work. So it could be licenses, options, um, interinstitutional agreements with other um, universities whereby the IP is co-owned, um, NDAs that might be important when you're sort of <clears throat> starting a um, a relationship with an, an outside um, company as a potential licensee. We also work with um, Craig's office and sponsored programs, um, you know, giving advice on, on sponsored research agreements. Um, and then, you know, occasionally I'll get involved in some um, patent prosecution advice depending on whether, you know, it's a commercially significant um, case or if there's a significant amount of, of legal research that needs to be done that maybe we just don't want to pay somebody outside um, um, to do. Um, and then a lot of um, IP uh, ownership advice. I did want to circle back, though, to, to Dennis's um, question on the on, on the, uh, the copyrightable material question. So the way that the rule reads, now I'm pulling up the full rule, right, because Scott only had the, the succinct version. It says if, if, um, if substantial university resources are, are used in the development of educational materials, a written agreement between the author and the university setting forth the terms of copyright ownership, division of net income, and external sale, and use revision and maintenance is actually supposed to precede the, the um, creation of that work. Now, oftentimes, it doesn't proceed, so you sort of have to go back and figure it out. But I want to make it clear that it sort of just depends on what that agreement is. There is, you know, an opportunity for university ownership of that um, multimedia project, which would constitute substantial university resources. Um, but we wouldn't, you know, ipso facto necessarily own the work. It's really by agreement. Question? That agreement, uh, am I correct in assuming that that agreement only applies to faculty who have developed some sort of online project? If you're a staff member and you develop it, the university It would typically be considered a work for hire, hire, which comes within a different subsection. So so the, 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 the faculty ownership of kind of the traditional works of scholarship, that only applies to, to traditional faculty. Thank you. Any other questions? So yeah, talk to us early and often. I have a couple colleagues, Brett Malin, Charlie Hanford, that we work with. Uh, uh, feel free to reach out to any of us, and we'll help you 
get through the process. Very good. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you all very much. You know, uh, we've got a few things uh, to kind of wrap up here, and then if there's any other questions that you've been uh, burning to ask, we'll, we'll take a couple more questions. But uh, we, we do want to thank you very much for choosing to uh, invest your time with us today, especially on such a cold, cold morning. Uh, and we, we believe there's a lot of significant returns by us getting together and having a converse, conversation, sharing information about IP as well as several of the other topics that, that are going to be coming up. Um, what we do want, though, is feedback from you. So uh, there are these, these sheets here. We would encourage you to fill those out, provide us your comments so that we can continue to improve these, make sure we're addressing the right issues that are important to you. Uh, those are the things that we want to do to continually um, perform better. Um, the, the other thing that is important for you to know is some of the dates of additional events that are coming up. On March 12th, we will be uh, holding an industry-funded research uh, Let's Talk series. And so if you've been, had questions about how that uh, works, uh, you're wanting to explore that, that would be a great event. It is in the, the same location here. Uh, also, March 13th, uh, a day after that is the IP and university event that is occurring, and it will be, I think, located over in the law school. I'm pretty sure it's in the, yeah, in the law school. And so that'll be a great opportunity if you would like to know more. It's a great lineup of speakers. Uh, we're very excited about this new center starting, and we look forward to that event. So would highly encourage you to attend that. Uh, on March, excuse me, on April 21st. We will be having a Let's Talk on broader impacts. So, for example, some of the federal agencies, such as uh, National Science Foundation and some others, are really encouraging that uh, you need to have a broader impacts in your proposal. That's very important. Uh, they want to see what the impact is, and so there will be an event uh, that day to really help you understand how to enhance the competitiveness of your proposal. Uh, as well as several other agencies are looking at similar types of um, components to their proposals. And then on April 23rd, we will have an entrepreneurship uh, Let's Talk event where we'll be going over uh, understanding exactly how uh, you can move forward uh, in starting your company and learning about the various resources that do exist. What you will notice uh, on the back of the agenda is a list of uh, all of the resources. So if there was something that, that took place today and you'd like to know a little bit more about it, you can look on the back of the agenda and there is specific contact information uh, that is available uh, to you there. So uh, uh, it's a great place to, to find other information. Of course, you can always contact the Office of Research Graduate Studies and Economic Development at any time and we can help direct you to the appropriate uh, individuals to help you get your your uh, questions answered. So before we wrap up, we do want to see if there are any last questions that anybody might have. I think that was a wave. I don't know that that was a question. Do we have a drawing? Are we doing? It? Okay. So if there are no further questions, me and giving a warm round of applause to all of the. Uh, speakers, and have a great day and try to stay warm. Thank you.